Welcome to Our Social Dilemma, a webinar featuring Nils Smith. Nils is Chief Strategist of Social Media and Innovation for Dunham & Company. Nils, let me hand it off to you. Thank you. I'm uh, so excited about uh, this time. I appreciate uh, those of you who are joining us uh, live, and, and, uh, and I know several of you are watching this uh, being rebroadcast or, or on demand. Uh, you'll see here on my slide uh, that it that it is having it does have a separate date, and this is a presentation uh, that I've worked on for the past six months, um, and it was a work in progress over the last six months uh, as I first had this concept for this presentation for the Dunham & Company Ministry Summit, and uh, for many reasons uh, that not everyone uh, could be there in Florida uh, for the original presentation, and so we're um, I'm grateful that Dunham & Company put together this webinar to allow uh, this, this presentation to be represented here today. Um, a few things I want to mention before this, uh, many of you that are on this webinar, uh, I am excited to see uh, in just a few weeks at the CMB event in Florida. Um, I will be doing a similar presentation, but it will be uh, very specified for radio, and, and there's a, some unique uh dilemma uh, issues that, that I think we're going to need to address in that conversation. And uh, we're actually doing, I'm doing it in partnership with my colleague, Danielle Rice, uh, and we're going to dig deep into data uh, in, in, in our breakout session. So I, I want to encourage you, make sure you don't miss that main stage session if you're going to be at the CMB. Uh, but I really want to encourage you to join our breakout session uh, because it's going to be a really great, deep conversation, uh, an important conversation around data um, as it taught, as it is involved social media uh, and, and where I believe that we need to go uh, as radio stations. And so I know everyone here isn't though a radio station. And so this presentation will be um, a, a lot more broad uh, for, for everyone involved. Um, I also wanna make sure you're aware that tomorrow uh, Dunham & Company has a podcast coming out on the Dunham & Company podcast and uh, or the Dun Dunham podcast. And uh, it's Trent Dunham and I having a conversation around our social dilemma where we actually dig deeper into uh, this issue uh, in a more conversational way. And uh, I know you're going to want to listen to that and, and get more insights out of that time. Um, I do, uh, I, I want to just quickly expand my introduction beyond my title. Uh, I am uh, based in New York City. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife is actually out of town this week, so I am a solo dad uh, with these two kids, and uh, I'm grateful for the team flexing around my schedule today as I have to run to pick up my kids from school uh, right after uh, this presentation. Um, I, I also want to note this is a total uh, side tangent, and this is the way my mind works, uh, but I'm using a, a new app called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P, uh, that, that it eliminates background noise on Zoom. And I live in New York City, and uh, its background noise is inevitable. And so if my audio, if you hear no background noise today, uh, it's because of that new app. So if there's no other value that I bring to this webinar today, I hope it's that you uh, learn about Crisp. It's a free app. Um, I don't know how they make money. I don't know how it works, but it has been... Um, you know, a life changer for me living on Zoom so much. So I'll avoid the tangent. Uh, the other thing I, I do want to say is I want to say hello to my Dunham & Company family that's watching. I know several of you are watching there in the Dallas office uh, enjoying pizza. Uh, I am also going to be having pizza after this webinar. Mine is going to taste much better than yours. Just saying, New York City pizza is the best. And last thing I want to know before we jump in, uh, there's I've written two books uh, that that I think uh, are are very valuable in this time. And, and those that are watching, one is the Social Media Guide. Uh, this gets very practical on how to use social media. We're not going to be talking about these things necessarily today, but uh, but this is really foundational to our social media strategy. Um, and then Crypto for Good. Uh, if you follow me on social media, you know that I'm passionate about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Um, and if you're not prepared for what's coming uh, with cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, um, I, that book is, is a very good starter uh, with where to start. And, um, and I, I just think it's a really important conversation that's progressing very quickly. And Bitcoin shot over $62,000 yesterday, by the way. So let's get into the presentation, uh, the state of social media. So as we look at social media today and, and where it's come, uh, we're now over 20 years uh, of of the world with social media. Social media has been, I'm 40 years old, more than half of my life. Uh, I have had uh, access to social media. 
And this is the current state of social media. You can see the, the continued growth month over month, uh, year over year uh, across all social media. And now there's over 4 billion global users. Now, now there's not even 8 billion people in the world, which means that more than half of the world's population is now actively engaged on social media. That's a big deal. And, and, and I remember 10 years ago talking about social media and people just thinking I was crazy and this is just a fad for teenagers. Um, it is obviously well more than a fad. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's interesting here as we look at uh, this growth and the, and the engagement that's happening is how much uh, the, this technology, these mobile, mobile devices have connected our world. There are now actually more mobile devices in the world than there are people. That's unbelievable to think about. Um, I, I, you know, and you probably have an old phone sitting around uh, like me or uh, everyone, my eight-year-old, uh, she actually just turned nine this weekend, uh, has her own smartphone. Uh, the, the world is becoming more and more connected. What Elon Musk is now doing with, with this satellite internet and high-speed internet being available uh, now everywhere, um, that the possibilities of, of what the internet and mobile technology and social media have done to connect the world is, is just, it's amazing. Um, and, and the possibilities for every organization because of this growth are, are, are tremendous. And, and so we look at a platform like Facebook. I, I, I hear regularly like, is Facebook dying? Is fa you know, Facebook gonna become like MySpace? Well, if you look at the trend, it definitely isn't trending down. Uh, I think we definitely see different demographics engaging more significantly on Facebook, but especially when it comes to global engagement, Facebook is, is still by far the most significant social network globally. Um, and continues to have such significant footprint um, across multiple generations and demographics uh, and have such a wide breadth of engagement. Uh, and we, we continue to see Instagram uh, continue to grow uh, in, a, in a very significant way uh, and how engaged people are in, in the trend that we expect to continue to see on Instagram. Uh, I wrote a book um, about eight years ago called Social Media Guide for Ministry. I'll actually talk about it later. Um, and one of the things that I put in that book that I'm proud of is there's this coming social network that's brand new that you're going to want to invest in. It's called Instagram. Uh, and it's fun to see where it is today. And obviously, after Facebook bought it and people thought they were crazy for paying a billion dollars, now it seems like they got a steal on Instagram when you look at the engagement that's happening and the growth that continues to happen there. Uh, if you're not yet familiar with TikTok, uh, you're probably not. On the internet, you're not paying attention uh, because TikTok continues to, to explode. It, it is the fastest growing social network in the history of social media. And what we saw in 2020 here in America uh, was very significant when it comes to the engagement that's happening on TikTok. But but even prior to that, the engagement and the growth that happened in China uh, prior to it coming here to America more significantly, uh, and now it it continues uh, to grow. Uh, with the amount of time people are spending on it, the average user is spending about an hour a day on TikTok. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And honestly, the technology is really incredible. The algorithm that they use to, to learn your behaviors, to, to give you the feed and the content that, that they believe is going to be most engaging for you. It's powerful. Um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we look at YouTube. Uh, YouTube, you know, was a phenomenon 10 years ago of, man, lots of funny dancing videos and cat videos and, you know, keep your video under two minutes and people are just watching these short videos and mobile video. Uh, YouTube has changed a lot. YouTube is now basically television. My kids, <laughs> my kids think Netflix is old. You know, that's what the old people watch. Uh, they just watch YouTube. Uh, my kids are nine and 11. Uh, I, I, I think that we're seeing a, a pattern. I'm, I'm 40 years old. When I look for something on the internet, I Google it. You know, those younger than me, if they're looking for something on the internet, they YouTube it. YouTube is a platform that's unique that, that people are uh, engaging in more and more. But, but the average video length has gone from basically two minutes, you know, a few years ago to now over 10 minutes. Uh, people are really engaged in long form content now more and more on YouTube. Uh, and the engagement, the, the number of users continues to increase, but but beyond even the number of users, the amount of time being spent on the platform is continuing to increase in a very significant way. 
Pinterest is is a platform that we saw in many ways seem to flatline uh, over the past couple of years and then explode fastest growing by percentage in 2020 of any other social network. And so it's it's really interesting to see these social networks uh, begin to shoot up. And, and what we're really finding in the world of social media is, is that we're having these niche platforms that are really beginning to thrive. You, you see a platform like Nextdoor that's thriving for neighborhoods or LinkedIn uh, for business and professional connections and Bleacher Report for social or, or for sports uh, and that social engagement around sports. And, uh, and, and so you're finding these, these niche platforms or Twitter around news uh, that are engaging people in a unique way around a specific area. And I think we're going to continue to see more of that happening rather than the, the mass platforms. Now, I think TikTok is one of those exceptions that, that has come now reached the masses, but I don't think we're going to see as many of those mass platforms as, as much as we're going to see these niche platforms that uh, as we look to find uh, the, the, the audience that we want to engage, uh, figure out where they are and how to best engage them on these various platforms. And so that's the world of social media. Uh, as somebody, as the chief strategist of social media and innovation, it seems like such a great day in history that that we can accomplish our goals with, on these platforms that have so much data and, and that we can so customize who we're trying to reach and, and, and that there's so much attention there and we can reach anybody anywhere uh, through uh, mobile technology and through social media and it's free. It's free, right? And, and so Facebook, you can have an account for free and Instagram, you can have an account for free. Uh, but the reality is, I think that we all know there are strings attached. Nothing is really free. So I want to talk about some of the issues around social media, um, and, and you've probably, uh, you, or you might have already seen the Netflix documentary Social Dilemma, uh, and that really addresses, uh, and, and I say documentary, it's more maybe kind of a, a horror film, uh, if you've watched it, uh, the, the way they really address it, but they address the consumer's dilemma. And, and the consumer d does have a significant dilemma of how their data is being used uh, but but I think that we as organizational leaders, as nonprofit leaders, uh, or as ministry leaders, we have a dilemma that that we face uh, when it comes to social media. We actually have maybe layers of our dilemma that's different uh, from the end consumer, and and that's what I really want to look at uh, in this in this presentation in our time. And, and then I want to get very practical uh, as to how we address that dilemma. And then I want to answer as many questions as we can today. Um, you know, that, that would be helpful around this topic around social media in general. So getting into the issues, um, so there's 4.2 billion uh, users. There's 5 to 10% of Americans, psychologists estimate, uh, meet the criteria for social media addiction. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. Are, 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 they estimate 5 to 10% have an, a literal addiction to social media, uh, and and I think all of us probably could identify a friend that we would say, you know what, I think they're addicted, and and maybe we're that person, uh, but but I do think that that you know I, I with my phone, if I get under fifty percent of my battery, I kind of get the shakes. You know the the addiction I think we have of we we keep our phones next to our bed. We that there are behaviors that that are being developed, and and what we don't know, and and as a parent, it's scary for me today, of what. You know, I, I, my nine-year-old was eight years, you know, I got her phone at eight years old of what giving her that technology this early, like, well, how is that going to impact her in, into the future? Now, I love that I can call her, you know, get a hold of her and track her and certain things, but, but, but simultaneously, there, there are other issues that are, that are being created that we don't know the long-term effects of these. But what we do know at this point is that addiction is a real part of, of social media, 35% uh, of, of teenagers uh, with low social emotional well being reported have been cyber bullied when it comes to using social media. Uh, that's scary. Uh, that's scary as a parent. That's scary of what, what does that mean down the road? 35%. Uh, that's, a, that's a very large number. And so as we think about the effects of that uh, in, in the coming decade uh, or future decades, uh, that there's going to be issues that we've never had to deal with before uh, because of this issue. Uh, and two hours and 25 minutes is the average time on social networking and messaging daily. Two hours and 25 minutes. I, I remember growing up and always hearing, you know, like, gosh, how, how much time are our kids spending watching television? They're, they're watching the television like an hour a day. 
uh, well, the average time on social networking is two hours and 25 minutes. That's everyone. Now, I think teenagers probably even more significant than that. Um, it's this is a this is a serious issue that's happening, and you can see why uh, the addiction is happening. And, and I think we're we're spending so much time on these mobile devices uh, that that there's a, a danger connected to them, and most significantly is with young single females uh, that that are addicted more significantly than anyone else uh, in, in the world. And so there's a tension that as leaders. If social media is causing such a problem, should we be using it? Is it as if we're giving people alcohol or or other addictive things by by even being present in these spaces? That's a dilemma I think that we have to face. And and here's here's another part of the the reality. And this is 2019 data uh, of it, it, if we wonder like is is Facebook going to help people not be addicted or YouTube or Instagram like. I, I don't know what that number is uh, because I, I've not ever had to count that high, but that's how much money Facebook and YouTube are making from our attention. That addiction is making them lots of money. And the more addicted we are or people are, the more money they're going to make. So so it might be free for us to use, but but there's a cost. And, and I think we've got to have our eyes wide open to understand uh, this business model and, and how these platforms function um, and why uh, they, they do what they do. Uh, well, at the end of the day, their business model is to keep their attention to sell ads and they're making great money uh, by providing good technology that is uh, keeping people's attention and being engaged. In, in the movie, The Social Dilemma, one of the well-known quotes is, if you're not the customer, you're the product. And so that, that's the consumer's dilemma. Um, is that they're not the the customer, they're the product. But but what we are is in many ways is we are providing the content to the the product, and and, and so the the social networks are providing the technology infrastructure that I believe that we couldn't create on our own. It it, it is so powerful this technology, uh, and it is the best developers anywhere in the world are, are building the artificial intelligence and these algorithms and the stability. Um, and, and I think we've seen like just how significant this technology is and how much it continues to progress all of the time. And it helps create this customized great experience uh, because of the data that they have. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, that's that's our dilemma, is are we leaning into uh, what's what's effective, uh, and, and or what's causing these negative effects? So, cybersecurity researchers find that TikTok privacy vulnerability exposes users' data. So, we we've heard about TikTok um, and and issues of you know practically we don't know if TikTok is going to even be around uh, in, in the future, and and I think the flag that's been that's come about here is people beginning to understand that this is a data game. That, that at the end of the day, the reason that the American government is concerned about TikTok is because TikTok is collecting a lot of data on us. And, and they're collecting data beyond just what videos we're viewing. They're, they're learning our behaviors and our habits in, in such a unique way. And this is where I talked earlier about their algorithm is it's learning you specifically, and it's building a data set so that it will feed you the right content that's going to keep your attention better than ever and going to keep bringing you back to their platform. And so that's significant, uh, that data uh, that they're learning and what they're understanding. And, and that's why this conversation is beyond just silly dancing videos on a mobile phone. Uh, th- this is a data conversation and, and, and data isn't just, you know, ones and zeros uh, and in a, in a list of numbers that, that people look at on a chart data, the data is so much more. It's it's our phone number. It's our address. It's our likes. It's our interest. It's our, you know, in many ways, these companies know more about us than we often will know about ourselves. And that's why they'll feed us ads about products that we didn't even know we wanted until we saw their ad. And, and now we're buying that product because they know us so well. Data is a very powerful thing if used well. Uh, it's interesting to see most recently with the Facebook and Apple clashing uh, with the most recent update of the iOS update that's not giving uh, the data to Facebook like they used to. And, and Facebook is you know, pointing the finger 
at Apple and face, you know, Apple's pointing the finger at Facebook and uh, they're all in debate. And, and I think we're kind of stuck in the middle uh, w- without any control, but I think we're seeing some of the issues uh, that are happening. And, and then we saw uh, with Parler that, that at the end of the day, these social networks could just be shut down. And, uh, and, and we, we don't know, we don't have control over what's happening among these powerful technology companies uh, that that own and, and control so much of uh, the data that exists ar- about us and around us, uh, there's power that exists in that data, um, and and we're kind of caught in the middle of this. AI is deciding at the end of the day what's seen and not seen. A lot of people are asking me like, how do I know? How do I prevent my content from being shut down? Uh, like, who's shutting it down? There's somebody behind there pushing that button, look, looking for us. The the reality is 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 the, the accounts that I've been connected to that, that have been shut down, and there's been a significant number, um, it's AI. It, it's, it's the systems that will flag one word uh, because it's listening uh, to every word or it's reading every word or it's even looking at images and, and trying to capture different things. And these flags will flag the system and they'll pull it down. And because they've had so many issues with content going out uh, before they've, they've been able to take it down, their AI systems have become extra sensitive to we're going to lean on the safe side of just shutting things down rather than keeping things up and making sure it goes through a process before we shut it down. And, and so because of that, we don't know what those triggers are always going to be. And so AI, at the end of the day, is deciding what's seen and not seen. And we don't know exactly what that is. And we can't just fix it. Or there's not a phone number we can just call uh, when those issues come. And if you have that phone number, I would love it because I've been looking for it and I've gotten it a few times and then those people leave uh, these companies. Um, and so it, it is tough uh, in, in this situation where in the past, when when we had something go down, we could just call the power company. Uh, we could call uh, whatever that service provider is. And there's not a phone number to Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, but the bottom line is if AI isn't making the decision, these are the people that are. I mean, these, these four individuals uh, that is, you know, owner of Facebook or the, you know, CEO of Facebook, Twitter, Google, and Amazon, uh, at the end of the day, own, own the most data in the world. And, and they're data companies. Now, Amazon's a data company that helps sell products and it, it actually run the internet in many ways uh, off of uh, their servers. And Google is, is a search engine, but it's building a search engine on data. And Twitter, Twitter is is essentially, and Jack Dorsey actually runs Twitter and Cash App, um, and, and it's a data system, and Facebook for sure is a data system, and Facebook is making so much money on the data that they've built uh, through the years. Uh, that that's at, at the end of the day, uh, these are data companies. Uh, but but I think we have to we have to understand that there's either going to be automation that's making these decisions to shut down these accounts, or it's these people. And I think these are essentially the governors of the internet. And so that's that's our reality. When, when we decide to engage in this space, it, it's important to, to know who's in charge, who's making the decisions, uh, and, and these are those individuals. So that's the issue around uh, social media. Um, and, and I want to share, uh, and, and because this has become a personal uh, situation and circumstance for me, um, and, and I want to share my personal journey uh, with social media and, and what's brought me uh, in many ways to this, uh, this moment in this uh, presentation uh, is my journey with social media started right here on AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, when I was 19 years old, it was uh, 1999, I'd been a Christian about 18 months and was invited to be a youth minister at St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Baytown, Texas. And a seventh grade girl asked me on that first youth group, it was just two kids there. She said, what's your aim? And I said, well, my aim is to reach every teenager in Baytown, Texas. And uh, she said, no, what's your aim? And and I was like, I just told you. And she said, no, what's your AOL instant messenger? And I had no idea what that was. And she you said, go get that CD and put it in the computer and use the phone. And, you know, you get on the internet. And, uh, and so I learned about the World Wide Web and AOL Instant Messenger, and I was Nils BYX, by the way. Uh, AOL Instant Messenger recently died, um, and so it, it is no longer uh, a thing. But but I, on that first day in ministry, uh, was introduced to social media, 
And, and I connected with those teenagers uh, right there on social media. The next day, I went from two kids to like 12 kids going bowling um, from kids that I had built a relationship with on AOL Instant Messenger. And that digital relationship turned into physical relationships. And we saw dozens of kids come to Christ that summer uh, through primarily through digital engagement on social media. It was the most powerful tool that I had in 1999 to do social media. So I just leaned in. That's what I knew accidentally because a seventh grade girl taught me how to use uh, AIM. And so as I began to develop, and I was in youth ministry about a decade, uh, I, you know, I began to use MySpace. Uh, and we all, uh, you know, had a friendship with Tom. Um, and, and Tom was in our top eight. And um, if you remember your top eight, and uh, Trent uh, would for sure be uh, in my top 16, I don't think you'd make the top eight. I just want to put that out there. Um, but Trent, maybe, you know, we can talk about that later debate. Uh, who would be in your top eight? I'd love to know uh, if I'd be in your top eight. And then I, I could debate on whether I'd add you to my top eight. But we'll, we'll have that conversation later. Um, so MySpace came along and, and basically you could kind of build your own website. And it was about you. And then you could use that co to connect to others. And this became kind of this digital presence uh, on the internet, and, and I think it's what kind of brought social media mainstream in a more significant way. And music uh, was such a central part of that MySpace experience, uh, which then led me in the world of social media um, to start. I was invited to uh, as, to become the social media pastor at Community Bible Church in San Antonio, Texas, um, and 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 the pastor Robert Emmett, you know, said, "Hey, we're." Uh, this was about a decade ago. You know, we're we're trying to um, build a church on the internet. We've launched ten campuses. There were mega church in San Antonio, and um, and and we really like it. I'm tired of parking lots and all this stuff. And I hear uh, that Life Church is maybe trying to do a church on the internet. And and you seem to know how the internet works. And maybe you could help us do that. Would you be willing to give it a try? And uh, within within about a month, uh, we 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 were having about eight thousand. I say at the, we had about three thousand people a week joining us uh, within the first four to six weeks from, from all over the world. Uh, and we decided we bought the domain onlinechurch.com, and we decided to lean into uh, this new platform uh, called Facebook.com. Uh, it was a website, you know, that you went to back then. Um, and we leaned into the the right platform. In many ways, we 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 guessed right. And, uh, and this is a map that we put on my wall uh, in my office. This is back when I had hair as well. Uh, I miss having hair, um, but sorry for the tangent again. Uh, but we, uh, we put dots. Um, we put a, put a little pin everywhere somebody would log in. And, and essentially, we took our local church global um, by, by just putting it online putting it on the internet and, and allowing people to update their Facebook status and invite their friends. And we grew our Facebook page to about 800,000 organically. Uh, we'd have over, over 100 different countries represented from about 15,000 people that were attending our online services uh, within the first couple of years. Uh, it was incredible uh, to see. And you can see the dots there in Africa and India and uh, Saudi Arabia and, and really incredible and exciting to be on the forefront of using social media uh, to build a church. And we essentially church planted on the internet. Uh, that led to uh, this book. Uh, this is the book I mentioned earlier that I wrote about eight years ago. Uh, group Publishing heard about what I was doing and asked me to write a book about social media for ministries. And uh, I wrote this book and um, I read it not too long ago when I actually wrote my most recent book to go back. And a lot of the foundational principles are are still relevant, but I talk about social networks that no longer exist. You can see Foursquare on here. Faith Village is one that maybe several people uh, are familiar with, but uh, that no longer exists. And uh, you can see Instagram there at the top. Uh, but but really, social media has come a long way and changed a lot from these early days. But back then, it was my seat was to go tell people, go get on the internet, go use social media. And I've been preaching that for many years. And I still believe that, that there's not a more significant opportunity to reach people globally than through social media it, is they have connected the world in such a way um, that that it's just that it, it's limitless in many ways. So the possibilities are huge and, and we're dealing with these tensions 
and, and that led to me, uh, you know, about five years ago, transitioning out of that role at Community Bible Church into being the chief strategist of social media and innovation here at Dunham and & Company. And, and it was such a humbling experience. I remember when Trent Dunham first reached out to me and invited me to, to uh, join the team. And, and I remember just thinking, <laughs> I, I hope he doesn't figure out that I don't have all the answers. Um, and, and, and because, you know, I look at somebody like Randall Taylor, he's, he's the guy who knows everything about TV and radio. Like he, you know, I remember meeting Randall and just thinking, gosh, uh, you know, just a hero in, in somebody who pioneered. Uh, ministries and TV and radio and 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 really just sits at the top uh, of that uh, you know that area and, and Liz West who I'm here next to who, who really is is the just brilliant uh, if you've got to know her and, uh, and and just her branding and what she's done court in you know the corporate world and in the ministry world um, and and how I ended up on this team was just like I can't believe it uh, and, and the reality is is I get to kind of then be and, and Donovan and Company brought me in to to kind of then bring social media integrated into uh, their incredible strategies uh, and with their incredible ministry partners uh, and so incredibly humbling that that I you know ha- had this voice from this unique experience that allows me to then bring social media to hundreds of ministries out of uh, the experimentation in many ways that I did of planting that church on the internet and uh, the successes we saw out of that. Um, and so then this also led me to this. And this is Twitter's, uh, this is Twitter's data on me. You can actually go into your Twitter account uh, and it's one of the things I really appreciate about Twitter is they will allow you to download their total library of data on you. <laughs> and I think uh, some people would expect an Instagram actually did this a few years ago and they're like, here, you can download your data and they give you like five things like, oh, you like sports and you like religion and, you know, uh, and, and they, they, I felt like they made you think that that was all the data they had on you. Well, this is real. And this is folders and folders and folders of data on me. Every post I've ever liked, every tweet I've ever retweeted, every follower or person I've unfollowed, it's all in this data. And, and so Twitter is really you know, sharing this data. Twitter has the least amount of data of any of these companies, by the way. Uh, and this is the data they have on me that's eye-opening uh, of, of, of understanding that, that this is we I've given this amount of data to this company. Now, I haven't paid, I actually have paid Twitter some money uh, in different times uh, for different circumstances, but I, I haven't practically on my personal account paid uh, Twitter uh, for anything. And, and so perceivably it was free, but, but at the end of the day, it did, wasn't free. It cost me my data. So I'm in a place now where, where I've got to feel this tension of, did I lead ministries down the wrong path for the past 10 years? Did I lead us into this place of encouraging our congregants or encouraging those connected to our ministry uh, to, to, to basically give away their data uh, to these other companies? Did, did, I, did I lead people into this place of like, okay, now do Facebook, and now all of a sudden the plug's going to be pulled on you or the you know, carpet's going to be pulled out from under you? Um, have I made a bad decision? And at the end of the day, there's a real tension of like my my last ten years are are professionally are fully invested into that. I've written books on it, um, and, and what what do I do? You know, and and is this something that that is this a mistake that I've made? Uh, I I've had to wrestle with that, and and I want to be clear that that that's that's something I will continue to wrestle with. I never want uh, to, I, to to push something that I don't fully believe in. And I, and I think, uh, and I think if I came to the point where I would have said, um, this isn't the right path, then I'm going to transparently say that, uh, because it's not worth just trying to maintain what I've said in the past, uh, if it's the wrong direction for the future. And so this is what brought us to, uh, today, uh, at, because at the end of the day, uh, this is how we have to, to navigate, uh, this dilemma. And I think we've got to define the dilemma. And then we, we're, I want to talk about the solution to the dilemma. So bottom line, and, and here's some questions I think you need to ask yourself um, as you navigate this, because I think you have to decide this for your organization. But but I definitely have opinions that I, I believe are how we uh, collectively should navigate 
uh, social media moving into the future. So first is, are we supporting or encouraging unhealthy habits by using social media for our ministries? Are we supporting or encouraging unhealthy habits by using social media for our ministries? I, I think this is a fair question. And, and I think it's something that we we need to ask ourselves is, is by being present there, are, are we basically saying this is okay? And, 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 and I'll just address this directly in my opinion to this question is that uh, I, I think that, that the Bible is very clear with the great commission of going to all the world and make disciples. And, and at the end of the day, if half of the world's population is spending two and a half hours a day on these platforms, we have to be present here. But, but I think that said, it, it doesn't mean that we need to be encouraging those that are already connected to our ministry to be going there. I think we need to be present there. And sometimes we have to build a critical mass there to get the attention. And, and we've got to play the algorithms and uh, we've got to use social media to do that and use some of our people uh, that are already engaged with us to do that. Uh, but, but I think practically we have to navigate this tension. Uh, this isn't a definitive, you know, yes or no answer. Uh, I, I think this is a, I, and I do also think that we have a responsibility to help people uh, that that have become addicted or, or have unhealthy habits. And part of our social media messaging should probably be stop, you know, pause, put down your screen for a little bit uh, and helping people have a healthy relationship with social media. Social media is not bad in and of itself. Social media is an incredible thing. What it's done for me personally, connecting me to old friends and keeping me connected to family members and current friends, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I can't even imagine life without it. Uh, but, but I think that, that at the end of the day, like I, I also, there's a lot of things that, that it brings into our lives that, that aren't healthy. And we have to learn how to have a healthy relationship with social media. The second question is, are we helping social networks access the data of our people? Uh, this is a real question. If, if we're driving people and pointing people to social media, if we have a link off of our website to our Instagram account, are, are, are we basically saying, hey, if you're here, go there um, and, and connect uh, to our, our so, these social networks? And I think this is the question that we have to really probably wrestle with more and more. And, and the question that I'm processing is, is we probably are moving into a place where we don't want to drive as many people to social media. We want to drive people from social media to our own properties. Um, and, and I do think there's there's a real rationale to get people uh, from from social or from our website to social. And, and I think social still organically provides a great opportunity for us to, to connect with people on Facebook and through email and on other platforms. We don't, we don't want to just move people from Facebook to email and then no longer engage with us here. We want them to engage with us in multiple places. So it, it keeps us diversified in how we're engaging with people. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that this is a time to be a little more cautious about when, how we're sending people that are already engaged with us to uh, these social networks, um, because it is, they are capturing data of the people and we don't get that data. They get that data. Uh, we can use it if we give them money, uh, but but they are the at the end of the day is uh, becoming the gatekeepers to that data uh, that they're getting when people are going and spending time on their sites. Are we building something on rented property that will be soon taken away? I, I can tell you definitively, yes, you are building something on rented property when you are building a social media following. Um, the question of will it soon be taken away? My, my answer to most ministries today is probably not. Now, I I think it will, some will, or, or some nonprofits and organizations, um, it, it will be soon taken away or has already uh, been taken away. A lot of the organizations that I've worked with in the Middle East, uh, it's a it's regular the situation uh, of these accounts being taken down um, and, and being defined or flagged as, as hate speech or wh whatever the situation might be. And in Australia recently, and I'm if you're in Australia watching this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing a separate presentation soon uh, because your unique situation um, ha has re I opened a lot of eyes, and I, and I think there's some other strategic things that we need to do uh, with with your organization there that that we'll talk about in that in that other presentation, getting into more more detail there. Uh, but but at the end of the day, I, I think we we have to know uh, that that we don't own that audience. Now we can get upset if our account gets shut down, but at the end of the day, it's their platform, it's their website. Uh, they own that audience, and 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 they have allowed us to use it for free. But I think we've got to know that that at any point, 
they can they can take away the contract and take the keys uh, just like if we're renting a building uh, and the landlord kicks us out uh, there's sometimes there's nothing you can do you don't own that building they do and they decide who's who's in there or not in there and at the end of the day that's the power that Facebook has and Twitter has and Google has um, and so we we really uh, I think have to have our eyes wide open when it comes to building that audience on social media so that's our dilemma. That's what we're facing. And, and these are the core questions uh, that, that we have to navigate. And I think it's a tension that we have to manage. And, and so I think the bottom line is, should you use social media anymore? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, the tension is clear. The opportunity is huge. But I think the question isn't, should we use social media? It's how do we use social media in this new day? Uh, as things are changing and as this landscape is changing um, and where this is going, we don't know. I don't know. Um, but, but I think that, that we, we see and uh, you know, we, we see just trends uh, that, that continue to happen. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day too, we, we cannot depend on the government to figure out how these platforms are going to be governed in the future uh, that we, we've got, they're, they're governed. By those CEOs that that I that I listed earlier, uh, they, these are self-governed platforms, and, um, and and I think in some ways it's gone too far too fast for us to in for them to to really be governed. I think TikTok is probably the one platform that is new enough um, that that we could see some interesting changes too, and we can answer questions of that later. Uh, but here's our bottom line uh, to our, our recommendation, and I just spoke to this: is don't wait on the government to figure this out. Uh, don't, don't just, I think we've often said that in the past of like, you know what, the government's going to figure this out and I just need to focus on, you know, and, uh, it'll all be okay. Uh, I don't know that it's all going to be okay. Uh, if you're dependent on social networks to do the work that, that your organization is, is called to do, uh, don't expect iOS 14.5 to solve everyone's problems or r- ruin everyone's lives. There's been a lot of people that are like iOS 14 is going to destroy our, our, Ministry, if, if your ministry is so dependent on Facebook data, uh, you, you, you're in an unhealthy place. Now, I think there's huge opportunity. I don't think the opportunity is going away because of iOS 14.5. And I also don't think that iOS 14.5 is going to solve all of the world's data problems. Um, and so we, we can't just, Apple's not going to fix this and Facebook's not going to fix this. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, we, we almost don't even know definitively what, there's not a definitive problem. There's just a, there's a complex situation that's developing, uh, that, that we're collectively figuring out and we have to figure out as content providers and as organizations and consumers have to figure out on it from their perspective, how they are going to navigate these waters. And, uh, these tech companies are going to have to figure out how they're going to continue to navigate it. But at the end of the day, the tech companies are who's in control at this point. Uh, and, and we have to understand that. Uh, and here's maybe the most important point. Don't use social media as your database. If you're dependent on, on Facebook to do your work, you're, 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 you're in a bad place. Facebook should be an asset to what you do. Instagram should be an asset. Twitter should be an asset. YouTube channels should be an asset. Uh, but if you are dependent on these platforms, you need to work hard to to break that dependence. Um, so that's not saying you need to abandon them, uh, but but that is saying that you need to be cautious uh, with, with your dependence on these platforms. And so the solution is to own your audience. Uh, th- this is the bottom line, and, we, and this is something we've been preaching before. Social media is how important it is for you to have the data of the people that are connected to your organization. And and I say data. You know, I don't know that you need to have as much data as Twitter has on me, uh, but but we need to know uh, those people. We need to be able to connect and communicate directly with uh, those people. We need to have them on our own properties. We need to be able to send them letters. We need to be able to send them emails. We need to have them going to our website and know how to get to our website in case something gets shut down. Now, that's what we can control uh, but we shouldn't just be here. We shouldn't just be on owned properties because we have to get people to own properties. And I believe that social media is actually the best place to, to find, build awareness for your organization to then bring them to 
your own properties. But but bottom line, we cannot leave people on social media and that be kind of our one-stop shop for all things communication. So here's where we need to move. Uh, we need to focus on these three steps. We've, we need to collect data. Uh, we need to protect our data and we need to use our data. So so we, we have to, at the end of the day, just like Twitter is collecting data, we, we need to know what's your name? What's your, how old are you? Where are you from? How, how do you like to be communicated with? What, you know, what, uh, what's your birthday? So I can send you a birthday note. What's, we need to get that data. And then we need to protect this data. It hurts me so much when I see organizations uh, who, who have a database and they just, you know, here, um, let me email you the password and you can have access to all of our data of like 20,000 email addresses. And it's like, no, we've got to protect our data. If, if our data gets breached, if somebody hacks into our data, and I promise you people, the more you're growing your database, uh, there are going to be hackers trying to get into that database. And if you lose trust of data being lost, and we see this with organizations happening right now, um, we, people won't trust you. People won't want to give you uh, their channels of communication, and that, that trust is going to hurt your organization. It's a massive liability. So data collection is critically important, but data security is also very important. And so as we're prioritizing data collection, um, we, we need to protect our data. Uh, and then the bottom line is, is data is useless if we don't use it effectively. So we've got to find ways to, to visualize our data to make better decisions, to use that data to better uh, customize our communication uh, to uh, data. There's just a, there's a lot of layers to data and we're not going to solve all of that. And that's uh, in many ways for those of you, I look forward to CMB that we're going to dig into that uh, in our, in our breakout session. Uh, but when we come to, to data, look, start with a name and address. You, you don't start by like going on Facebook you shouldn't go on Facebook today and say, hey, here's here's a form. Can everybody go fill this out? And it's name, email, address, birthday. People are going to give you all of that information. It's, it's a process. It's like a dating relationship where you don't ask somebody to get married and have a kid on your first date, most likely. You know, you ask them for their phone number, then you ask them on a date, then you ask them on a second date, and, and you build that relationship. And then you ask for they're, you know, and then you connect with each other on social media. I don't, I don't know how it works. It's been 20 years. Uh, but it, I think at, at the end of the day, it's a process to building a relationship. And so start with a name and email and then begin collecting more and more data on those people. Uh, get their history with, with the organization. Get, find out about their hobbies, their interest, maybe their giving capacity, their communication preferences, their personal experience. All of this data is valuable. And so as you begin collecting that data, data and building out the database, you can better serve and support and, and engage uh, that individual. And that's what, we're, that's what we're getting used to today is that, and it's the value of the algorithm, is, is the algorithm is feeding us uh, the most effective things for us uh, when there's just too much for us to consume. And the more we can customize that communication, the better we're going to engage uh, those people into the future. So we have to get better at and more intentional in collecting data, not just allowing Facebook and Instagram and Twitter to own all of the data. Um, you know, this is just an interesting point when it comes to engagement. Um, of you can look at the social media channels of, you know, you with your followers, only 1.22% of them uh, are engaging with your your Instagram posts and less than 1% on Facebook. Um, and, and But you can look at email, open rates are 18% on average, SMS open rates over 98% on text messages, 97% of all text messages are read uh, within 10 minutes, um, or actually I think within five minutes. Um, sorry, I forgot that exact stat wrong, but bottom line, 98% open rate, uh, it's powerful to own our audience, but it, it doesn't mean we don't use Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. These are valuable tools uh, that will move people to connecting with via email, which, who will move people to being connected with SMS. And when we've got them there, we don't stop engaging with them on Facebook and Instagram. We, we want to engage them across the board in different ways. Um, and so it's valuable to keep that connection. Uh, but but understand this is where we want to move people for that deepest level of engagement with our organization. And then we need to protect our data. You know, I think this starts with password protection. Uh, but but I think there's a lot of tools online and we can't, I'm actually already going way over um, my time here on the presentation. Um, and so we've got to protect our data. We've got to use um, tools like LastPass uh, when it comes to security protection um, and even VPNs and 
uh, we, we won't go too deep into that uh, right now, but we need to think about password sharing, access levels of reliable CRM, really probably cloud-based, but even tr who, who you're trusting with your data. You need to be backing up your data, uh, but, but really getting smart with your data security uh, and then using your data. You know, are, are you using your data to make good decisions? Are you using your data to customize uh, communication? That data is such a powerful tool uh, for our organization. And so that's the bottom line, is when it comes to social media and how we navigate this social dilemma, we navigate it by being more intentional, by collecting data uh, rather than giving away data. So we need to use data in decision making and personalizing messaging and budgeting and, and customizing communication and, and receding and hiring and organizational efficiency. Data is such a powerful piece to every organization today uh, and should be a key part of your organization uh, into the future. So the bottom line to today's presentation uh, in our social dilemma is that social media should be used as a tool in your toolbox, but don't depend on it. Don't depend on it. And I think that's the question you need to ask yourself is, are we dependent? What happens if Facebook or Instagram or Twitter shut down tomorrow? What happens to our organization? Are we okay? But that doesn't mean because it could shut down tomorrow that we should abandon it either. Just don't be dependent on it. And I think that's a simple solution. And, and, and I think the way to not be dependent on it is to own your own data and to, to use it uh, to get people's attention, but then move them uh, into your own properties as soon as possible. And then the last thing I want to say uh, as we wrap up and maybe I have a chance to answer a few questions is to stay flexible. Uh, you, this social media landscape is, is always changing. In, in 2020, who could have predicted uh, where we were? And, and so many ministries weren't prepared for 2020 and many died uh, because they weren't prepared for the, a world that went completely online for a little while. I, I think practically uh, we saw the value of social media for so many organizations over the past year. Uh, but we also, I think, continue to see the a lack of dependence or, or a lack of ownership and, and, a, and a complete dependence on social media as well. And, and so I think practically, and, and this is where this presentation might be very different three months from now, uh, is, is things are changing. Things are changing rapidly and laws are changing and TikTok could be shut down soon or uh, Clubhouse could explode even more. And we've seen some trends there. We don't know uh, always what's coming and it, it continues to seem to speed up all the time. But as leaders, and, and what I want to encourage you to do is, is to stay as flexible as possible. Uh, when it comes to these new technologies, these emerging technologies. And I think the best way uh, that you can be prepared to be flexible is by owning your data. Because when you own your data, you can just text everybody and just say, you know what, we're no longer on Facebook, we're going to be over here. Or we're going to, you know, you, you want to make sure you engage with us over here too. Or, uh, but, but at the end of the day, the more we own our audience, the more flexible we're going to naturally be. So I see that we've got uh, probably about five minutes here to answer a few questions. So I'm going to uh, try to read through a few questions here. Um, one question here is, is there a specific social media platform we should be keeping a close eye on? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that I, I would say that uh, Clubhouse is probably the one that I'm spending uh, the most time on right now or paying attention to. Uh, I don't believe that Clubhouse is going to be the next big social network. I don't think that most leaders should be spending time on Clubhouse, it takes a lot of time to really engage. Um, it's a slow uh, place of, of engaging and connecting. Not everyone has access yet. Uh, there are a lot of issues, but what I do think that is emerging is a new medium of, of audio-based social networking uh, that I think is very powerful. And it's almost like a, like a live uh, and interactive podcast experience. And so I, I think Twitter is, is integrating a, a similar functionality into their platform. And, and I think you're going to see audio becoming a more significant part of our lives because we can do it passively while we're in the car, while we're doing other things where all other social media really takes our eyes uh, and, and attention. And, and so when we can have our eyes on something else, but we can be engaging with it while we're working out or doing other things, and it's why things like podcasting and radio have always been, uh, and audio has been a big part of our lives. And so an audio-based social network makes a lot of sense, and I think will continue to grow and emerge. Um, what do I think about of the end of Facebook analytic means? Uh, okay, I'm going to repeat this question. What, what do you think the end of Facebook analytics means uh, for, the, for ministry social media? 
Uh, it's a great question. Facebook, uh, if you didn't hear the announcement or get an email about it, is shutting down their analytics platform. Um, I'm disappointed to see this because I think it was a really valuable tool that most people did not use. Um, and so I, um, yeah, I think that I, um, I don't know, <laughs> you know, what, what this means in many ways for, uh, for data, but, but I do, I do think that, um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's more reason to depend on our own data, you know, and so Facebook in many ways was, was sharing a lot of data with us that I really liked seeing and learning about people. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, they've decided to take down that analytics platform. Uh, but I think probably because people are already putting the pixel on their websites for advertising purposes. And so they're able to get the data um, without uh, that analytics tool being the value proposition of, of giving access to the, the data. Um, and when you put a pixel on your website, you're giving Facebook data. Uh, by the way, I think it's worth it because of what you can do um, with the access uh, that they give you from a retargeting perspective. But it is you are giving them data uh, to to be clear, um, and and that's you know just part of understanding and having our eyes wide open in this space. So that said, I I don't know what analytics means for the platform. I'm going to stay on and keep uh, answering as many questions as I can. Um, I got to make sure I got to pick up my kids. Um, and uh, and so if you've got to go though, I I definitely understand that. But I want to I want to answer as many questions as I can or. Uh, Greg or whoever cut cut me off if I need to to cut anything off. Um, and I apologize for going long and not being able to answer as many of questions. Um, given all of the giants in social media are clearly in one side of the privacy debate, is there room for one or more players on the other side of the privacy issue, i.e., more privacy? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think we're going to see. Um, this is where I think some social media uh, platforms will emerge is in the privacy area. Um, that that has a more has greater transparency to privacy. Um, I think Twitter actually has a unique opportunity to to really expand and grow because of their um, their most significant um, uh, display of of transparency with their data. Um, and so I, I do think that there's going to be uh, you know some new social networks that that emerge that people will trust more uh, because of of privacy. Um, just to have privacy controls. That I, I think the other side to that though is if we don't give them our data, our experience won't be as good. Our experience is better uh, because of the data that we give them. And so I think that we, we need to, it's valuable uh, to give them our data. And so I think we, um, we need to understand that part of the value uh, to us is them having our data because of what they do with it. Um, Let's see, Nils, what are the best practices for over-the-air radio broadcasters to synergize, synergize their social media and um, OTA strategies into one comprehensive overall strategy? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, that's probably not a, 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 qu a quick one I can answer here, and hopefully we can connect at CMB uh, and, and talk about that. But I, but I do think, I, I think one of the things, especially on-air personalities, that's important to note is people connect to people better than they connect to organizations on social media. And so I think one of the great things that personalities can do on social media is to connect with people through their personal um, platforms or their personal Instagram account in particular seems to be where the best engagement is happening or, or personal Facebook page. Um, and, and so to use that personal connection of, of follow me and we can have a more personal relationship, it, it feels human to human, even though it sometimes is, you know, human to mass audience uh, through those those channels. And so I think just being intentional to uh, engage in a more personal way, I think that social media can create integrated uh, connections. And then I think organizationally is where you want to then be moving them into uh, in, into that, you know, more owned properties, but rather than moving them from the organization social networks, I think on-air personalities can actually use their own personal uh, platforms to engage effectively there. Um, JR, it's great to see you here by uh, on the webinars. Thank you for your question. Uh, if Facebook analytics is going away, what does that mean? Okay, answer that question. Um, good question, JR. And uh, we have no more questions, it looks like. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um,
are there any other announcements before we, we wrap up? Nils, we're out of time for this webinar, but I do want to thank you for your insights. And remember to look for an email from Dunham & Company in the next 48 hours that will give you a link to watch this webinar again and share it with your friends and colleagues. We hope you'll do that. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.